We are live with Inside Scoop with Sue, and welcome everybody. Um, we are a little bit late, some technical issues, but um, I'm thrilled to be here with Dr. Mar Mark Galston. And I didn't get to ask you first. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Cl Goulston, Goulston. Oh, Goulston, Goulston. Okay, Dr. Mark Goulston. There we go is the inventor of Surgical Empathy, which we're gonna learn more about, a speaker, executive coach, and the author of Just Listen, which is behind him there, which became the top book on listening to the world, in the world. Um, so here's what I wanna start with. Um, first of all, I was so grateful to just virtually meet you through your work because, um, yeah, you have a lot to say on suicide prevention and things that we don't know. They're not intuitive. So I am really excited to give this information over to our parents who are suffering, as you know. Um, so tell us first, you're the inventor of surgical empathy. What is surgical empathy? Well, surgical empathy is, if, if you've been suicidal, you'll understand this, sadly. Uh, when you're suicidal and it doesn't go away, death is compassionate to hopelessness. You know, when you feel hopeless, no future, you feel worthless and useless. Death is like the sirens calling the sailors onto the rocks. I'll take away your pain. And so what happens is people who are in that kind of pain attach to it and they keep it in their back pocket in case some, everything gets awful. So surgical empathy, what it is, is, and here's a more complicated term, uh, empatholysis. So if you know what dialysis is, it, uh, lysis means to break things. And so empatholysis, which is the process used in surgical empathy, is you want to go in there and break their attachment to death as the only way to relieve their pain. And a lot of people who are uh, depressed and suicidal, they are very locked and they can't go to where you're at. And they're not being stubborn. They're just locked inside. And so they're holding on to death in case everything gets bad. So surgical empathy is a way of going to where they're at. And uh, can I share an anecdote which will give you a taste of it? Please, please. How much time do we have for today? Half hour. Oh, there's plenty of time. So this is not about teenagers, but this taught me about uh, the need to go where people are. Uh, years ago, I was called uh, into UCLA to put a man uh, on restraints for his arms and legs and to give an order for a antipsychotic medication because he was pulling at his IVs. He was pulling at his, the tube in his neck. He was pulling at everything. And so I go up there and he's all tied down and he can't speak and his eyes are as big as saucers and he's screaming at me through his eyes. Uh, 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 and I said, what is it? What is it? And he's going, uh, uh, uh. and I give him a pencil, his hand uh, uh, was tied down. I said, write it down. And he scribbled and they said, he's just psychotic. You know, we had to calm him down. And so I told him we had to put your arms and legs down and I've given you a medicine to help you calm down. And when you calm down, we'll take everything off. And he's just looking at me like this. And then uh, the next day they paid, they, they paged me and they said, Mr. Jones is up. He's off the respirator. He's sitting up in bed and he told us to page you. So I go into the room, Susan, and he looks at my eyes and he says, pull up a chair. And he seats me with his eyes and he doesn't let go of my eyes. And he says, what I was trying to tell you is that a piece of the respirator tubing was broken and stuck in my throat. And do you, and do you understand that I will kill myself before I go through that? And I am telling you that was the lesson that flipped me. And I realized that that's true for a lot of people. A lot of our teens, they need us to go where they're at. And when we start to give them solutions, it's great if the solutions work. But then when the solutions don't work, uh, the parents get scared, they get frustrated, and, and the teens aren't trying to frustrate their parents. And then add to that, the teens start to feel burdensome. You know, I saw suicidal patients for 30 years. None of them died by suicide. And I tried to figure out what the heck I was doing. And this was a real poignant insight. I remember one of them came in and I said, what helps? And he looked at me and he said, you're the only person who enjoys me in my life. 
To everybody else, I'm a burden. I scare them. When I see you, you smile and you're glad to see me. And it's not attached to whether the, did I follow treatment. And he said, you're an oasis where I know you're not, where I know I'm not a burden. Because when I feel awful, <clears throat> I feel like a burden to everyone. And then I just think to myself, well, I'm pretty worthless. Why don't I just relieve everyone of me? So is this giving you some insight, Susan, about why we need to go where they're at? Yeah, and I, I think it's really amazing and such deep insight. And both those stories are so powerful. And yet I have this flip side, which is you are the psychiatrist. You, your emotional attachment to this patient, child, teen is very different than mine as a parent. Can this, can we somehow at the same place that you are in the office? And I just, I don't know how I would let go of the fear, how that wouldn't just be oozing from my being every time I, I heard from that child. So here's a, here's a parent version of surgical empathy. Uh, but you can see that I think I've described that surgical empathy, you, you break their hold on death as the only way to relieve their pain. And you have to give them something where they feel felt. Now, one of the reasons we're afraid to feel what they're feeling is we parents have our own anxieties. We struggle with depression and we don't want to all drown. But here are four steps that uh, you can use as parents. If you're talking to teenagers, uh, don't do this with a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Teenagers can't stand these face-to-face -face talks where, uh, unless they initiate it, unless they say, I got to talk to you, mom. I got to talk to you, dad. But wh whenever you initiate it, they, they pull back and they feel they're going to be lectured. They feel they're going to feel your anxiety. So what we recommend is when you're doing an activity, you know, so you're in motion as opposed to they're being locked in. It could be it could be doing the dishes. It could be running an error. And and this is how you slip it in the conversation. And this is the exact script. You say, uh, you know, a lot of us parents are worried about our kids because of COVID. So you're not telling them that there's the problem. You're saying everybody's worried about how COVID has affected their kids. You know, you've been locked in, school's changing. Uh, you feel a little behind in school. Can I ask you a few questions? but you have to say it without the nervousness. And you know, and if you're lucky, they'll say, okay, that's cooperation from a teen. Yeah, okay, mom. And then, and then you say to them, at its absolute worst, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life or yourself? And they're gonna go, what? And, and, and you have to ask it because what you're wanting to do is get them to, get it off their chest and let go of their depressed and suicidal thoughts. And they may say, uh, pretty awful. Uh, and then you say, pretty awful or really awful? Okay, okay already, really awful. And then you say, and when you're feeling it, how alone do you feel? And again, they might say, pretty alone. And you say, pretty alone or all alone? Again, you're trying to pull it off their chest out into the air and into your love and safety. And so they might say all alone. And then you say to them, take me to the last time you felt that. And they're going to go, what? You take me to the last time. We, we kind of heard you walking around the room last night in the middle of the night. And, you know, we figured you weren't, uh, you weren't able to get to sleep. And here's the interesting thing that happens is when another person can describe in clear detail something. Yeah, I was up. I didn't know whether to uh, punch the wall or put my head into the wall. And I, and then what happened? I kept looking around for some sleeping pills, your old sleeping pills. I couldn't find them. And then what happened? I just kept pacing. And then what happened? The sun rose. And, and see, when they say it, they're not alone. And if instead of jumping in with your anxiety, you're trying to, again, get them to pull it all out. So surgical empathy is like draining an abscess. And it's a hopelessness abscess. And so as they're saying that, they're going to start to feel relief. And if you're lucky, they will start to cry. So don't have the crying scare you. It's actually the relief they feel because they're getting it off their chest. And then what you say to them, with all the love and with all the 
emotion and your eyes watered up with how much you love them and you don't want them to feel pain. And you say, I got a favor to ask you. And by then, hopefully they won't be so defiant and they'll say, what? Whenever you're feeling that way, or you don't even have to be close to feeling that way, I want you to do whatever it takes to get your dad or my attention. Whatever it takes, because we're caught up with everything we're caught up with and there is nothing more important to us than making sure that you're not alone there. So would you do that for us? So can you follow those steps kind of? Yeah, I mean, the first time I heard you say it, I I understood the power in it. But with the attachment of your stories, I, I feel like, um, you know, the, the terror of asking your kid these questions is that you get answers, right? Like that is the terror of going into it. And we're not trained in how to respond to that. So, you know, when there's this idea of saying to your kid, have you ever been suicidal? Have you ever felt suicide suicidal? Like, I think a lot of what keeps people from doing it, I know myself too, is what do I do with the answer to that question? But you just pivoted that for us to say that the solution is the talking. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, there's an exercise that we're rolling out into the world that we want parents to do every day. And this will not only lessen uh, suicidality and depression, it'll lessen anger in teenagers, it'll lessen impulsivity, and it will improve marriages. So are you waiting with bated breath? Well, I'm fascinated. Yes, of course. Yes. So every day, and we're going to roll this out as a program, every day uh, what the parents do with their kids is – they're going to they're gonna say, we're going to do this every day. And every day, the parents say, we're all going to share something that we felt upset about today. And I tell parents, don't bring up something really scary like, well, I lost my job and we have to move and we don't know where. So, so everybody brings up, what is something you felt upset about? What did it make you want to do? What was your impulse? Made me want to do this. What did you do? I did this. How did that work out for you? Well, blah, 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 blah. And then, uh, is, did you learn anything from that? But the point is, children, there's a saying, children don't listen to their parents, but they never fail to grow up to be like them. And so, uh, children need parents to model being able to be upset and, and being able to talk about an impulse without acting on it. The problem is parents have problems with that. When they get upset, they react. And so what children are seeing is parents that react. And I bring this up that it can help marriages because if you do this exercise every day, and by the way, you do this every day, your teens are going to pass it on to their kids and your teens are going to remember this as one of the best moments they ever had growing up as a family. And it's going to help marriages because after you do the exercise, husbands and wives are later on going to say, you know, what I really wanted to say that I was upset about was you. And this is what I ups was upset with you about. And my impulse, you know, was to yell at you or say something and try not to say it in front of the kids. But what I did instead is we did our exercise. And what I did instead is we're talking about it now, which is something we never do. So in that story, just to clarify, so partners in, in raising these children, are they airing their own stories? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Way? Absolutely. Uh, and, and it could be, uh, what did you feel upset about? It? Uh, well, I got yelled at by my boss, you know, because something wasn't right. You know, what did I want to do? You know, I, I wanted to quit. What did I want to do? I wanted to yell back, but, you know, it, it would not have gone well. What did you do? You know, I just, I just, I just took it. I just took it. Uh, I let my head go through all these thoughts about wanting to quit. Why do I have this stupid job? And then I calmed myself down and then I got the work done. 
Okay, and are people giving, I, I wanna clarify this because it seems like we could end the conversation at the end of this, even though we're not. Like this this is a game changer in your in your eyes and it seems to me like it really could be. So are, are we only asking the question and listening or is there any kind of problem solving going on in this well, conversation? Well, the problem solving is what did you learn from it? Because I'll give you a little insight about hel how to de-helicopter yourself as a parent. <laughs> What helicopter parenting means is that at some level you're anxious and you don't trust your or have confidence in your child's judgment. So you're on top of them. And, and even though your anxiety pushes you to helicopter, uh, if you can get into the practice of asking these kinds of questions uh, and they start to tell you what their impulse was and what they did do, the more that you start to find out that what they did do was pretty smart, you're going to have confidence in them. Here's another tip that parents uh, like. Uh, when you're doing an activity, and this will help de-helicopter uh, you because that doesn't help your children, is when you're doing an activity like driving, you can ask your kid, can I ask you, you know, a, uh, you know, a hypothetical question? You probably need a different word than hypothetical because it has too many syllables. But, you know, can I ask you a question? What? And, and you want to seed in them judgment. So you might say something and you have to fill in the blanks. Uh, who do you think is going to get in trouble this year in your, in your class? What? I'm just curious. I'm not telling you to avoid them. I'm just curious. Well, uh, John's going to. Why? Oh, because he got in trouble three times last year. Really? And, uh, uh, and, and let me ask you, uh, uh, if you go to a party, how do you tell the difference between a party that's a little bit rowdy and a party that's getting dangerous? And again, you don't tell them what to do. And whatever they say, you say, really, how'd you come up with that? And then you say things like, how do you tell the difference between a class you can study for at the last minute versus one you got to stay on top of? So what you're doing is you're getting them to tell you how they would problem solve. And can you see, Susan, that when they start to come up with stuff that really not only makes sense, but is better than your answer, you're going to start to have confidence in them. So your assumption is that kids are able to do this better than we would anticipate, but that isn't true for all kids, right? No, that isn't true for all kids. But the point is you can start with little questions, you know, uh, but, but the idea is you you want to ask them questions versus telling them what to do. I have a saying, you know, from my book, uh, Just Listen. Uh, the way to influence people is not what you tell them, but what you enable them to tell you that really matters to them and that's bothering them and getting it up into the air. And then you help them solve it. Now, I realize... Uh, patients who are in a rush, and they all are, that's a problem. Uh, I'm going to throw in something from left field because I hope I'm wrong in this, but it's got me really worried about millennial parents because I'm a grandparent and I'll be with my grandkids and we'll go to the playground and I'm starting to see this and I hope I'm wrong. Millennials as a generation are not particularly patient. Part of that came from technology, you know, because technology, I, I mean, I don't know if you've known this, Susan, but some of them type so fast, I don't even know how their fingers can move like that. The thumbs, I mean, the, thumbs. It, <laughs> it, the thumbs. It's unbelievable. Uh, and But I think that they're impatient. And what worries me, and I'm seeing it, and I hope I'm wrong, is that a newborn infant doesn't respond like an algorithm. And, uh, and it can try your patience. Uh, when that infant won't go to sleep or won't feed or won't do something, it can try the patience of a young mom who's usually with that infant. And what I'm seeing is the young mom, of course, doesn't want to get angry at the child. So she deflects it towards her husband. And I'm seeing this more and more because by nature, they don't know how to be patient. They don't know how to hang in there and know that it will pass. 
and, and, and they don't want to feel angry and be a bad mom. So they start snapping uh, at their husband and the husband sort of doesn't know what he did. And so I really hope I'm wrong on that. Well, I would say the impatience could also be seen as at our fingertips are solutions to everything. We rarely have to struggle with not knowing the answer to something. And so parenting is a place where I don't, I don't actually think that's new what you're talking about. I think, you know, we're always looking for solutions. Um, some of them critical and life-saving like today, but also just many other ones in our lives. Um, so I want to take two comments. Stephanie says communication with your child is key. They need to be able to trust you and come to you. Fantastic. Stephanie, thank you. Kimberly says, thank you, Susan, for giving the parent perspective. We as parents have a greater emotional investment and attachment to our children's responses than a therapist or a counselor. So I, I want to talk about that a little bit because I know I felt my kids are out of the house, but I know I, I looked for solutions. I asked and invited people to give me other ways to interact with my kids. And then I said, no, I can't do it. Um, and so now I completely agree with Kimberly here. But what I want to suggest is we know we're in a situation right now that's dire and you're telling us something that seems simple, challenging, our own emotions get in the way of it. How do we, how do we just kind of say, that doesn't feel like me, it doesn't sound like me, but I'm going to try it anyway? <laughs> well, because we're, we're, I'm, I'm asking you to develop a, a, a new muscle called empathy. Empathy takes time because it means you have to let go of what's on your mind. And if we're rushed, we want to check boxes, feed them, clothe them, get them to do their homework, get them in the car, get them in the bus, uh, and then go and do something else. And they pick up the, uh, uh, the agitation. So I'm going to tell you something that's going to feel totally unnatural, but I invite you to take issue with it, Susan. So, so you ready for the challenge? I'm always up for the challenge. <laughs> it's called the HUVA challenge, H-U-V-A. And if you can do this once a day for a week, it can, and it becomes, starts to become a habit, it will change all your relationships. So I like to build some suspense here. So what music? <laughs> so what music? So, uh, uh, and let's not play the music from Jaws. Blah, 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 blah. But uh, what HUVA stands for, is heard out, understood, valued, added value. So pick a conversation that you really want to connect and have it be a good conversation. And by good conversation, we don't mean that you were right and they were wrong. And they said, yeah, 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 and then didn't do it. So just pick one, and this is how you build the muscle. And we're all bad at this initially. So have the conversation and then rate yourself from the other person's point of view. So on a scale of one to 10, how much do they feel that I heard them out versus interrupted versus rushed them versus changed the subject? On a scale of one to 10, how much do they feel I understood them? And you show that you understand them by asking them to clarify something. When they say, I was really nervous about such and such, instead of saying, well, it'll be okay. You say, say more about being nervous about that. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how much do they feel I value what they had to say? In other words, did I take it in and think about it and I actually thought there was something pretty neat about it? You know, like, wow, that, that's how you figured out how to do that? That's really amazing. And then the final th thing is A, how much do they feel that I added value to what they said? And that might be, you know, that thing you just told me that you're doing, you know, uh, in your sport that's helping you in your sport. Could you apply that to your homework? Or so you add to something that they're saying, this is totally unnatural, but you can build it as a muscle. And, and you're right. And, and here's the thing. What we need to do is every realize that everything feels unnatural until we turn it into something we feel competent at. Well, also, we're all here trying to get some new some new input because it feels like what we're doing isn't working well. So that step from where we're comfortable to what might work has to be uncomfortable. Like it's not going to be natural to us. But when you're so when you're giving those examples, 
I'm thinking about just this past week where I failed my kid. And I can tell you that what put me in the situation of failing that kid was that I was nervous I was going to get it wrong. So I didn't allow for empty space. And I, I, you know, I think that I'm not alone in that experience. We are a little bit nervous about it, what we say next. Does it shut down the conversation? Does it open up the conversation? Like on this other sti- side of your advice are some really tough kids who don't necessarily want this conversation to happen. So how, how do you plow through like your own emotional fear and worry or even hurt? over you know what's gone on in the past and still be doing what you're suggesting. There's a new book out by Oprah Winfrey and Bruce Perry, and it's called What Happened to You? And I'd recommend it highly. And if you don't have time to read, if you look up 60 Minutes Trauma-Informed Therapy, Oprah Winfrey, you'll see the 60 Minutes Overtime segment because someone asked Oprah about having visited the trauma informed clinic that Bruce Perry runs. And she said, it changed my life. And she said, it was the most impactful story I've done in my whole career. That's a lot for Oprah Winfrey to say. And the reporter said, well, what do you mean? And basically what she was saying is that what trauma informed therapy is about is when someone's acting up in any way, it's being a defiant teenager, they're flipping you off. Uh, your attitude is what happened to you that caused you to do this? And she said, it, and Oprah said, it just changed the way that she looked at life because I think she was owning up to the fact that, you know, when someone acted up, that she could jump on them and say, why'd you do that? You know, make them feel wrong. So I guess what I would ask you as parents, do you believe that your kids are essentially good people underneath the way they act? I can only speak for me, but of course. (laughs) So if you believe that they're essentially good people and they're acting up in a certain way, then something must have provoked them. So what happened to you? And I'll give you some advice that I heard from a very wise rabbi that I know. He says that whenever his children act up, and he's talking to them. They know they're in trouble. You know, they're afraid he's going to guilt trip them. And so they already know they did something wrong. And what he says instead is, uh, what you just did is not is not who I believe you to be or who I think you believe yourself to be. So what caused it? I thought that was so eloquent. What you just did or failed to do is not who I believe you to be. And I don't think it's who you believe you to be. So, you know, so what triggered you and made you do it? Well, I'm going to just say this and then move on to a little bit more about suicide if we can. Um, But that requires so much presence. That requires so much self-awareness for us as parents. And, you know, life gets in the way from that. But I still, I still say we should all be trying everything you're saying, but um, you know, so Susan, 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 I'm gonna do yeah. an intervention with you. <laughs> trust, trust me, trust me. This, this, I love this, when I'm in therapy on, on Facebook this is, Live. <laughs> uh, this is this is good viewing. Okay. Yeah. So what's happening is you're you know listening to me, but you want to be responsive to your audiences and you want to speak for your audiences because they're all nervous and they're all agitated. And 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 so what's happening a little bit is your voice is kind of ratchet it up. So what about this? And what about this? And if I were to say, what's really going on? Well, I want to get a lot of information out, uh, you know, Dr. Goldston, and, and I know what parents are going through, but what, and, and this is another surgical empathy, but what's really going on, Susan? Well, you know, we're pressed for time and, and I want to get good, yeah, but what's really going on? If I did that five layers and you opened up, you'd say, I'm scared. What are you scared about? I'm scared that I'm doing stuff wrong and it's going to affect my teenagers. And I love my teenagers. And sometimes I just feel so caught up with everything I'm supposed to do. I feel like I'm not going to do it right. And I don't want my kids to grow up to be uptight or insecure, but sometimes I'm just scared and, and I don't know what to do. 
And if we could get to that level, Susan, you would calm down. You would share what you're feeling and what a lot of your viewers and listeners are feeling. And, and also what I'm saying, this is something, if you're viewing this, this is something you need to share if you have a halfway decent relationship with your partner. Because a lot of times we don't open up this way. We don't say, I'm really scared that I'm messing up our kid. <laughs> and we don't, say, wanna... we don't say it in that tone. Right. What happens is our agitation comes out and, uh, you know, our kids, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then what happens is your partner has to calm you down. But several layers below, what happened to you? Uh, I love our kids, but every time they act up, I worry this is the beginning of their starting to ruin their life. And I don't know if we can stop it. And when you can get to that level, I am telling you, if you have a halfway decent relationship, they're going to open up to you. Even a partly clueless husband is going to be more open to that than feeling agitated. What are we going to do? And, and it's going to help your relationship. Okay. So um, I want to say that Kimberly and Nita are both saying exactly what I was saying. And um, so hopefully we can somehow connect later, the three of us, and say how this worked out when we applied some of your advice here. I want to, we don't have so much time, but I want to go back to the, the suicide prevention. Um, and I want to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what takes, what have you seen commonality among teenagers where you can say, this is what is generally going on when someone hits that point? Yeah, I think what happens is you see a change in behavior. So they were previously outgoing, they're more withdrawn. Uh, they would previously, now teenagers don't have very long conversations with their parents anyway, but the conversations become really clipped, like, and there's an irritability to them. What? Leave me alone. Uh, and, uh, and if you can see through your anxiety, they often seem just incredibly sad. You know, they, they seem incredibly lost. Uh, and, and what they're looking for is a way to relieve the pain. That's why, yes, you can ask them about suicidal thoughts, but I'm more in favor of having them talk about what's going on underneath that might cause them to want to relieve the pain in any way possible. And then when you talk about, when you go through those four questions at its worst, how awful can you feel? And do you feel it alone? And take me to the last one and, and talk to me. You then earn the right to say, uh, have you ever thought of suicide? But when you just jump in because you heard, uh, and it's true, you know, they'll say, you know, asking someone if they're suicidal, does it increase their suicidality? And that's generally true, but it's, it's so uh, abrupt that you can, doing it is better than not doing it and then finding out afterwards something awful happened. But I'm just suggesting lead into it with a conversation because your anxiety, our anxiety as parents, can they're already overwhelmed. And when they feel our anxiety, they may say something just to get us off their back. You know, we did a documentary called Tell My Story with Jason Reed. And I hope you'll give a link to Tell My Story. Yeah, we, we actually spoke to Jason last week, last Thursday. Great. And, and he probably said this to you because it was really eye-opening to me. He said, you know, when you talk to your teenager and you say, how are you doing? And they say, great, they're usually good. But when your teenager says, I'm fine, they're usually not. When they say, I'm fine, now sometimes they are, but when they say, I'm fine, what they're really saying is, I don't want to talk about it, leave me alone. And, and here's a tip again, which is very unnatural, but I'm giving you advice that's unnatural. And it's not only unnatural, it's making many of you nervous, but this is an important episode that we're talking about. These are important tips that I hope you'll at least try. There's something that we talked about <clears throat> uh, in the film, <clears throat> and I have another documentary called Stay Alive, 
uh, an intimate conversation about suicide prevention, and that's available at truly.com, T-R-U-L-I. And I interviewed this fellow, Kevin Hines, who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And one of the things that I use, or I suggest you use, is if they say, fine, uh, uh, say, I know you're fine, uh, but I'm gonna run some words by you. You know, and just, just humor me and, and pick, the, pick the word that you can relate to. But again, you have to work on your tone because if you're coming from anxiety, your anxiety is making them feel worse. And the words are uh, anxious, depressed, frustrated, angry, ashamed, alone, lonely, overwhelmed. You can throw in other words. And they're going to say, what? Just pick one of those words that goes along when you're feeling really bad. And whatever they say, if they say, you know, uh, angry, say, uh, tell me more about that. And the reason this works is there's a, a fair amount of research mainly done by a fellow named Matthew Lieberman at UCLA. And I think he has a wonderful book out. I think it's called The Social Brain. He said, when people attach the exact emotional word to what they're feeling, they calm down. That's why, Susan, when I was saying before that if we could push you down, what's really going on, what's really going on, what's really going on, and we get through the agitation and you, and you look at me like a deer in the headlights and say, I'm scared. I love my kids. I see how crazy the world is. I don't want the world to eat them up. I don't want the world to bully them. And if the world's going to bully them, which is probably happening, I want them to be able to handle it. And I don't know if they can. But do you follow what I'm saying? That's a different level of conversation than rat tat 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 all right. Well, there is a ton of information here. Most of it is new to us. We haven't talked about it before. All of it sounds like worth trying for everybody who's listening. And um, Dr. Golston, say, tell me the pronunciation, Golston. It's Golston. You you were too <laughs> you were too anxious to to pronounce it correctly, but we'll give you a pass. Thank you. That's very kind of you, Dr. Golston. Thank you so much for being here with us, and thank you for the personal therapy. I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. One thing, I want to mention something also. Sure, if I'm sure. uh, uh, we launched a course on Himalaya.com uh, and it's called Defeating Self-Defeat. And it's an audio course. So Himalaya.com forward slash defeat. If you put defeat in the promo code, you can hear the entire uh, 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 course. It's, I think, 12 episodes and it's all audio. And and if the if if people who are listening in found some of what I said helpful, then we talk about things such as procrastination, mm -hmm. letting fear run your life, and uh, and I'll leave you with one tip if I can uh, on procrastination. What I talk about is we procrastinate not because we're disorganized or lazy. We procrastinate because we're lonely. Mm -hmm. And my proof for that is. There's a lot of people who have drinking problems that procrastinate and getting over it until they join AA, and AA helps their loneliness. On college campuses, you procrastinate cleaning up your dorm or your fraternity or sorority, and they're a pigsty, but you'll all do it on a Saturday. And what happens is when you can do something with someone, you feel a bonding. And when you feel a bonding, and here I'll just leave you with a little bit of neuroscience, you feel something called oxytocin. And oxytocin lowers stress, and the stress hormone is cortisol. So even though you want to withdraw from people, the more you can actually open up emotionally, the more you could say, Susan, to your husband, I'm really scared sometimes for our kids. I'm scared of our kids and I'm scared for them. But the more you can say that, the more that's going to invite him into a conversation in which the two of you will bond and you will feel better. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to add links in afterwards to some great resources that were mentioned here and not mentioned here. And really just thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here with us and participating.